Okay, so this is the fifth lecture. We're gonna talk about line integrals. So last time we had to develop our theory for complex value Riemann Stoges integrals, right? And some of their formulas. And today we're gonna continue our study. So before that, let's just um, get, uh, get some uh, definitions for complex value integrals. So the integral of this is the real part plus i times the imaginary part, okay? And notice that even for this function, we still have this comparison property, right? Because in real values, we have this property, but even in complex plane, we still have this property. So here's a proof. If it's zero, then we're done. So otherwise, let this uh, w denote the integral. Now we let c be the, a unit vector or unit Thing, unit complex numbers so that we have this is equal to the norm of w right because we define like this now we have this we can put it in right and this is really the real part because this is real number right so this is so this is equal to this and this is a real number if it's a real number the complex part must vanish so it's only equal to this Okay, so you go to this. Since it's real, the imaginary part vanish. Now, we can use our property for real, um, I mean, for, for functions, right? Real part is always, we have this inequality, it always holds. And this is equal to f because c, the norm of c is just equal to 1. So we have this less equal to f, which means that we have this less equal to this because this, these two are real value functions. We have this property, right? And they're all non-negative, so we have this property from real integrals. Now, we also have this, because they are real value functions, right? They are real value functions. And this, we go back here, this equal to this equal to this, right? Now what we can say that is this is really just this. So the thing we want to estimate is equal to this. In terms of uh because this is equal to one, right? We multiply by one. And this thing is equal to this thing because these two are equal. Right? And this thing, which is this thing is less than or equal to this thing. And this thing is less than or equal to this thing. So we can connect them, right? So as desired. Okay. <clears throat> so let's continue to move on to paths. And we let gamma be a path, continuous path, and we let this denote the image set, and we, we call it a trace. And we define it as being rectifiable if it's of bounded variation. So you're continuous and you're also bounded variation. And if it's, if it's also smooth, then the length is just this integral. And if f is continuous on a trace, then its composition is still continuous, right? So we can have this definition. So rectifiable continuous, then this d this, right? f of gamma is the continuous function, and gamma with a respect to gamma of t. Because last time we defined what is a b of f d gamma, right? We have defined what is f f g gamma. Now we're just replacing f by f of gamma. Okay, so just f of gamma d gamma. So this is called a line integral, and this is the notation. All right, let's just move on. So here's an example. So we have this, this, and this is smooth, right? We define gamma t to be e to the i t, and f z is one over z for z non-zero, then f is also continuous, right? Then its integral, so this integral is e to the uh, negative i t, d e to the i t. Now we can bring this, right, because they're smooth, then we just multiply by its derivative. And these two cancel out, which is i, so which is two pi i. Okay, and here's some notes. So if we have gamma is rectifiable and we have a phi that goes from CD to AB, or the domain of gamma, 
that is continuous, strictly increasing, and surjective. Or increasing, surjective. Then we know that phi c equal to a, phi d equal to b. Then gamma, we do the composition, is again a path, right? And we have a, they're having the same trace. Then this is still rectifiable. With gamma rectifiable, then if it composed with phi, it's still rectifiable because if we give a partition of c to d, then we have a corresponding partition of a to b. Right? So we have this is true. Right? It's the upper bound. This is the upper bound for all for all s with the partition of C O D, which means that the total variation, the supremum, right? This is the upper bound, so the supremum should be less than equal to the upper bound. So if f is continuous on the trace of gamma or the trace of this, they're the same, then this is also defined, right? because it is rectifiable and you're continuous on a path, then this is still well-defined. So here comes uh, to a proposition. Uh, it states that, okay, it states that this, this, continuous, non-decreasing. Then for any function continuous on this, we have, they are equal to each other. So even though it's well defined and it's equal to each other, so it it preserves the integral value under reparameterization, right? So here's a proof. Let's get the proof. So first, we let let epsilon greater than zero, and we pick in delta one, such that we have. For partition for partition of C D with all length like this and sigma case between them. Such that F, F sigma k because we know that this integral is well defined, right? It's very long. Um, S k subtract by S k minus one. Right, such that this thing, so we're given the mesh, so less than epsilon over 2. And again, we can also pick, wait, wait. yeah, okay, that's a 2, positive, such that for any partition of A, B, So we're given a partition of AB. So let's make some choice. Mm. T, T1, T, partition of AB, such that, actually we can just copy everything and we're just, we're just changing stuff, right? Such that we have. Let me just move this above a bit. Such that T. So T. The two. T. Tau. T. F. Minus 
gamma of tau k. Gamma of t, gamma of t. Okay. So that this whole thing is also less than epsilon two. Because because we know that uh, there exists such deltas, those deltas, right? Now what we're gonna do, what we can do, is that, well, okay, what we do is that, well, since we have this as uniformly continuous, right? So we pick pick a delta such that we have the uniform continuity property. So first we have this is true and we have when s and s prime s less than delta gives its output also differ less than something that is well here's the delta we want to do so if this is less than delta 2 right then we get something like this well, tk is like the output of sk, right? So, we just, if delta is less than delta 1, then this is less than delta 1, right? If this is less than delta 1, then we, we have this. Now we pick a con such that this is less than delta 2, right? Now, with that being said, We can have what? We can have we can cancel them out, right? Because if we have a partition, so if a partition if we have this such that S K is less than delta which is less than delta 1, right? And define tk as their output, right? This is what we want. Then, then we know that tk minus tk minus 1 less than delta 2, which gives that if we have, let me say my case between them, and we let tau k be this. Then we know that now with these all these settings we can see that oh these two holes at the same time and these two are equal right so like in the absolute value we subtract this thing with this thing so this thing cancels out what we have left is the absolute value of gamma f and the absolute value of f, right? And then we use the triangle inequality, right? Which is what less than equal to this plus this, right? This plus this, and these all these two, which is less than epsilon. Now we just let epsilon go to zero and we got it desired, right? As desired. So here's another definition. If sigma is a path and gamma is also a path, they being rectifiable, then sigma is equivalent to gamma if we define equivalence relation. So that if there exists a reparameterization, so if there is this mapping from here to here, continuous strictly increasing such that, okay, we have this too such that sigma is equal to gamma of phi so it's a change of parameter okay so with this equivalence relation given for all the paths we have an equivalence class right so a curve is an equivalent class of paths so to understand this so if we're given a path right we can have all different mappings that creates this line this thing so for all those paths who creates this 
their equivalent class is called a curve. So this is so so like so this is a curve, right? And the trace of curve is the trace of any member of the curve because they're all the same, right? Because they're all the same. And if f is continuous on the curve, the integral of f with respect to the curve is to and with any path of the curve, okay? Because now we have that with this proposition, right? With this proposition, such that blah, 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 right? We have these two. Then we have, they're equal to each other, right? If this, if this is equal to some sigma, then f, the integral of f with respect to any element from the curve are all the same, right? If, if sigma is equal to some this, right? Because now non-decreasing, strictly increasing implies non-decreasing, okay? Because in the book, it marks that it was a collection of very diverse, so each member of the group has the same trace, and so the integral on the function is going to use the trace the same for each part of the class. But we should define it because if this for some phi above, but it is not an equivalence relation. The equivalence relation requires that strictly increasing. Okay, strictly increasing is what we want. Okay? So, and we define a curve is smooth if and only if some representative is smooth. So the curve is just smooth. Okay? So here we give more definition. We let gamma be a rectifiable path. And we define this function. So this is the total variation of gamma from a to t. Right? a to t. The partition from a to t. Now obviously it's increasing, so it's a bounded variation. So for f continues this, we define this integral to, to be equal to this. Well, his definition, like, is kind of weird, okay? So f is a rectifiable curve, we define negative gamma to be gamma of negative t, for t from negative b to negative a. And gamma plus c is gamma t plus c. So here is a proposition that is left as an exercise. So I'll be prove A and C, but not like I'll just walk through it. And for this, I will not prove this, but I will prove this. I will prove this inequality, right? Okay. Because that that inequality is more important. So for A, okay. Let's just say this is gamma A. This is gamma b. Then, with the same thing, with the same exact same thing, we have this is that goes this way. Okay, so we're just going reverse direction. So if we're going reverse direction. Which means that when when we considering this difference, right? The difference here and the difference here, like with the give with if we're giving a same partition, right? This difference and the difference here, they're opposite of each other, right? Because this is this one subtract this one, but now is this one subtract this one so they're opposite of each other well if they're opposite of each other then they're sum so they're like some some in form of this there's some in form of this this part will be opposite of each other the f won't change like there it will be opposite of each other because this thing they're opposite so we can just we can just opposite and we can get something like gamma f plus, right? This is always less than f1. So, so we have the desired inequality, okay? And <coughs> for c, for c, it's like, okay, you're, you're adding, then you're shifting. 
right? Because, okay, if you're adding, then this sum, like you have plus C and here minus something plus C. So you're plus C and you subtract C. So this thing won't change anything, but here, because this is gamma of tau plus C. So you really want to shift back to get the same sum. Okay, so, so C is also good. Now for B, I'll prove B. So recall that we have the uh, comparison property for complex value integrals, right? Which is B F of gamma, B gamma. Okay, this is true for any Stelges integral, complex Stelges integral. Now, F of gamma. Is a, is, its input is real number, right? It's from A, B to C of our gamma, right? So we can apply what we have. So we can apply what we have, which is less than or equal to A, B of, of gamma, D gamma. Now, F of gamma. Right, it is by definition less than the supremum of absolute value of f, where its input is on a trace, right? Because f of gamma of t, right? Then for right less than this times a b one d gamma, and for one d gamma was go back to look at the sum, which is 1 times this. Well, so this whole thing is equal to 1 times this, and this sum, this is a telescoping sum. If you telescope, eventually we'll get, so we just let this equal to this, and by the uniqueness of the existence of such complex number, right, then we can say that this is really just the same thing, multiply by what? And this, if you consider the trivial partition, if we consider trivial partition, right, this is always less than or equal to the supremum times the total variation, right? which is what we want, right? which is what we want, because V of gamma times the supremum, right? V of gamma. Okay, good. So, and now we will de develop a, uh, a fundamental theorem calculus for line integrals. Okay, so before we look at this, we just we first look at the lemma first. We need a lemma to prove it. So the lemma is that let G be an open set and complex plane, and gamma is a rectifiable path, and if it's continuous, then for every epsilon, there's a polygonal path. Gamma in G, so there's a capital gamma, in G such that gamma A is equal to the level gamma, this. And we have this. So there exists a polygonal path such that these are true, and we have this. So to prove this, we need to develop some theory first. Okay? So for non empty sets, we define the distance between two sets is the infimum of DAB. And the distance of X with B is the element, is the infimum of this. Okay? So here we have a proposition first. dx is zero if only if it's in the closure. And this mapping is continuous. Okay, so the proof of this is by triangle inequality. Let's play around. Now proof A. Uh, I only prove one, okay? So one is that we pick in sequence. So if you're if this is true, 
then we can pick a sequence such that we have this. So to actually look like this, we can just say we can just follow by the definition. If the infimum is zero, then for any epsilon equal to one over n, we can find an element such that this is less than one over n, right? This plus which is one over n, which is using the infimum definition. Well, with, if this is chosen, then we know that this series, I mean, this limit goes to zero, right? If this limit goes to zero, then we can conf we can say that, oh, x is in the closure because for any epsilon neighborhood, Archimedean property, right? Archimedean property, we can pick a one over n such that this is less than epsilon. So we are never getting empty intersections, which means that you're in the closure. Now, if you're in a closure, if you're in a, then it's automatically zero, no matter what. And if you're not an A, again, because you are in a closure, we can pick this. Then this is the infimum of this, which is zero. Right? This is equal to zero because we have this. And again, by our communion property, if our infimum is non-zero, we can pick one over and that's less than this, which is a contradiction. So we have this. Okay, now here's a theorem. So AB is non-empty disjoint sets. If one is closed and one another one is compact, then their distance must be positive. Okay, so to prove it, we define a function this, and this is continuous, right? If x maps to dxb, and and I messed up, which is if b is compact. Right, so by ext extreme value theorem, we can pick a point B and B such that such that for any F B prime, right? Now, if D, if B and A is zero, right? So extreme value theorem is in lower bound. It uh it attains its infimum, its minimum. Now if we have this, then which means that B is the closure of A, right? Which is equal to A because A is closed. But they are disjoint, so you must be positive. So D of AB must be positive. Now for any d alpha and beta for alpha and a, beta and b, we have this is squared and this, right? Because for any beta and any alpha, you're always squared and infimum by definition. And since, uh. Since B is the minimum, right? B is the minimum. B is the minimum. So we have this inequality. Now, which means that this is a lower bound for all such distance, right? So if you're in female, you're the greatest lower bound as desired. Okay. So, let's just prove the lemma first. Okay, so the lemma states that blah blah blah. Okay, let's begin our proof. So, case maybe, maybe this color. Case one, so G is an open disk. Okay, so if G is an open disk, let's say just let G equals to some random ball, radius R centered at C, and we define D be the distance between the trace and the boundary of G. Now it is uh, positive because 
this is compact and this is closed. Well, you're just considering if you're given a disc and its boundary is just this by definition, right? And if you consider its complement, which is everything here and everything outside, which is clearly open, right? So it is closed. Then we know that their distance is positive. Okay? And they're disjoint, right? Obviously, because the trace is in G. How come you can intersect with the, the boundary, bruh? Right? You're all in G. Because this and G are disjoint, right? The boundary and the, and the interior. Well, the interior of G is itself. The boundary and the interior, they're disjoint, right? Okay, so now mm, we let let Rho be R minus 1 over 2D. Okay, we just let Rho be close to R minus 1 over 2D. And I'm gonna make a claim. My claim is that the trace is in the restricted ball with the same center. It's still in the restricted one. So someone just say that, okay, this is obvious, right? Because well, if it distance, then we just shrink it a little bit and you will still be in the set, right? And the author also says that, okay, then we have this, right? Then we have this without any proof. So I decided to prove it, okay? So my proof is that it took me so long to figure this out. So the proof is that, so first we have case one. Case one is that there exists an X that is in the trace that's in the trace, and you are on the boundary of the ball. You are on the boundary in the ball. Okay? Now, so here I will draw a diagram here. And another one, another one. Make another one so that they are on the same center, having the same center. So here's the center of the ball. Now you pick this point and this point. Okay? So you'll see this is X. Now, and we pick a Y. So that they're on the same line. Okay? They're on the same line. X is on the boundary of the smaller one, we pick a Y on this one. Then their, their distance is really just what? Y is in, the, is in the boundary of G, right? Which is B, R, C. And we know that 1 over 2 D, which is R minus rho just by our definition, okay, r minus, it's r minus rho, and this is the distance between x and y, right, like, like, you can, you can prove it, you can also prove it, but there's really nothing to prove, and because this, right, because y is in the boundary, then we have this inequality holds. And this is greater than equal to D, right? Because X is in the trace. We know that for anything in the trace, we have this, right? So we have one over two D is greater than equal to D, which gives a contradiction. Okay, so the second case is that Case two is that there exists an X that is in the trace and but not on not in the ball and also is not in the boundary. Okay, 
so it's not on the ball and the boundary. So think about there's an X that lies completely outside the ball. Okay, not even on the boundaries, even outside of the boundary, but still inside this ball. Okay? So then we have with the center it should be greater than row. Right? It should be greater than row. Because it's not even on the boundary. It should be strictly greater. And now we let this y is equal to some gamma of t because we're in a trace. Okay. Now we define a new function. We define a new function f not f not such that b f not of alpha gives you the distance between alpha and the center. Okay, so again, this function is continuous. Okay. Just think about the single point C. Just think about C as a single point set, then we still have its continuous. Now, with that being said, if we compose, compose with gamma, right? Then it is continuous on interval AB. And this is a connected set, right? So my logic is that, okay, if you have something like this, you have a point here, right? And you have a point here, then by intermediate value theorem, right, you'll get some point that is on the boundary, when, which goes back to case one, and then we get a contradiction, okay? So, but before I say that, we know that we need a, a point and this that's inside the ball, right? We need a point that's inside the ball. Because if, okay, if there's no, if there's no such point, if there's no such point, then this gamma lies completely outside this thing. Well, what this will cause, this will cause that. The trace and this will be less than or equal to the distance between C and C, right? Because if you can, you can just visualize it. You, you can also prove it, but I'm just lazy, right? You can, you can then distance between this and the boundary is it's going to be less than this, right? Well, this is equal to what? R minus rho. Okay, the distance between the boundaries. So the distance between boundaries is just it's just its difference, right? Like it's infimum, like it could only be its difference. Because at this point, well, at this point is like, like the shortest. If you just consider this, okay? It's the shortest by, I don't know, Euclidean geometry, maybe. So with that being said, I can pick a T naught such that gamma T naught is in a ball. Is in the ball. So what we have now what we now have so this is in the ball and and this is outside the ball right so if this then we know that f of gamma of t naught is in the ball then its distance is going to be less than rho and f naught of gamma of t is outside the ball which is greater than rho now you see the intermediate value theorem comes to play. So the intermediate value theorem gives given t prime such that 
f naught of gamma t prime is equal to rho. Right, because we're mapping it to we're mapping it to R, which is a ordered ordered field. We have an ordered topology, right? Then we go back to case one. By case one, we get a contradiction. Okay. So which means that no matter what, all your points should be in the ball. Okay. Now, okay, so so we have finished our claim. Okay, so what is the point of this? Then we know that F is continuous on this smaller ball and its closure because it is contained in G. Okay. Well, this is a closed and bounded set, which means that F is uniformly continuous. Right. So here is that, okay, if your f is defined on g, then there's a smaller ball such that f is uniformly continuous on g. So why don't let's just, at the beginning, assume that f is on something bigger, and then we have to shrink it, and f is contained, uniformly continuous, right? So without loss of generality, let f be uniformly continuous on g. So now, the nightmare begins. We pick delta positive such that we have our uniform continuity. Wait, f of s minus f of w is less than epsilon for any given epsilon book. and. Notice that gamma C is also uniformly continuous because you're continuous on a compact set. Continuous. Uniformly continuous. So there exists a partition. There exists a partition. Such that That first we have gamma s minus gamma t. The distance is less than delta over two whenever s and t are in sub interval. So this is the first one, and the second thing is that we have the what? Let me just okay. Let me just go upstairs. Such that this um, okay, such that this thing. Okay, let me just erase this. Erase this part. Okay. smaller right we're gonna have something like this it's less than so just say just epsilon okay we don't it's less than epsilon okay for for as usual tau k between them okay so this is possible right because okay we're using this con continuity and then we're using a we're using continuity, there exists a delta such that whenever st is close, like this partition, like with mesh less than some mystery delta such that and st are this close. So this is the uniform continuity. And this is the, the integral thing, okay? 
Now we're gonna make a something. We're gonna define gamma gamma from A B to C by we're gonna define so gamma of T is Tk minus Tk plus one of Tk minus T gamma of Tk minus one plus T minus T k minus one gamma of Tk. Okay. So what is this? So you can see that this is the line from gamma tk minus 1 to gamma tk is a line, but the length is this, okay? For, for t and tk minus 1, tk. So locally, it's a straight line. It's a straight line from here to here, locally. And globally, this is a polygonal path, right? So it is a polygonal path in G. Okay. Now I'm gonna do some estimation here. does this inequality hold? We just write, we write gamma tau k is equal to t k minus t, t k minus t k minus 1. So if you group them together, this t cancels out. You got tk minus tk is one divided by things, so we're just multiplying by one, okay? And we write this, and then we can go to the definition of this. So when we're subtracting, when we're subtracting, we have also have. less than delta over 2, right? Because this is by our given partition. Okay, so now, then we have f with respect to gamma is just a, b of f of gamma t times, because it's piecewise smooth, right? It's piecewise smooth. You're piecewise smooth. You're, you're a straight line, you're just, you're piecewisely a straight line, you're a polygon, you're a, now, well this is really just by direct computation, So this is the direct computation, okay? And notice we have this thing, right? So we have, let me just write it down first. The 
this thing minus okay so how do you observe this well we're using we're using um, okay so here we used a minus b less than equal to a minus b okay so this is our this is and we have less than epsilon so this is our a this is our b so inside these two cancels out when you're subtracting and this subtract is which is less than epsilon okay so this is what we used and here is epsilon plus we can estimate this even further of okay so this let me just write it down first okay So how do we come here to here using this formula? So first, like if expanding this as a sum, we notice that they have a common factor, right? And but this, right? We, uh, we want to factor this whole thing out. Well, this we have to multiply this by. Um, trying to multiply by this and multiply it by its reciprocal so we want to multiply by one which is this over this thing this thing okay this thing inside now we're integrating this the variable is t and this is our upper and lower bound so this is really just tk minus t k minus one of f of gamma tau k Okay, so here's the estimation. Now, notice that here we have this and when our range and we have its input is less than delta right well remember if this input is less than delta let's go back for f being uniformly continuous if its input are delta closed then we have this right so this is really just less than this whole thing it's just less than equal to epsilon right and I can bring a constant all the way in the front because this is our huge summation right which is epsilon plus epsilon of now with this epsilon left over the thing inside is just one and to integrate you got this thing cancels out which left only this thing Okay, which gives only this left. Now, this thing, this lesson is total variation. And we're done. Are we? No, we're not, because this is only case one. This is only case one. G is an open disk. Okay, so we're improving this first. And now case two is that in general.
Oh, it's a long one. Okay, so no, because this is compact. Then we know that we can pick pick R such that it is positive and is less than. So this is again by Archimedean property. Right, we're picking R to be satisfying this inequality relation. All right, so. And continu a uniform continuity of, of gamma. Okay. For any partition of A B such that with mesh. Mass is less than delta, then we have this thing less than r. This is what we want. Then we know that, okay. Oh, we have this is less than r, right? Because for t, for t being in the, in the interval, right? So now what we want is that, okay, we just want to restrict the domain. It's like gamma t equal to the curve for, for, for t is in Okay, so this is like the restricting, with gamma being restricted domain on here. Okay. Then we know that the trace of this is in what? Now, for t in here, gamma of t are r close with this, right? So it is in the ball of what? Gamma of t k minus one. So here we have a trace contained in a ball. So we're going back to case one, right? We're going back to case one, just treat each B as our G in case one. Now then we know that, okay, then we know that, okay, there's a gamma, there's a gamma K, right, on this sub-interval, rigorous to here. Right, to here. Such that gamma k of and Right? We're just using, using our result from case one. No, we just define so we're just uh we just we just uh stick all the gamma k together. Together we get a big gamma, a new function gamma, which is on A to B. Then we know that. This f is less than equal to the sum of this. F 
Hast du gesagt. Right. Because now we know that oh, this can be expressed as a piecewise integral. And this is also the piecewise integral, right? Because they're rectifiable, they're blah, blah, blah. We have this. Okay, so we have proven the lemma. We have proven the lemma. Okay, now we go back to fundamental theorem calculus, complex version. Open, rectifiable, initial points alpha and beta, continuous with a primitive or antiderivative. Then we have this. Okay, so this is theorem 1.18. So we again, we discuss the cases. Case one, gamma is piecewise smooth. Okay, gamma is piecewise smooth. Then, gamma, if gamma is piecewise smooth, then we know that M of F which is F prime of gamma times gamma prime by chain rule. Fundamental theorem calculus for a function like this. Uh, real input, right? F of beta minus F of alpha. By fundamental theorem calculus. No, if it's if it's uh, if it's in general. Well, in general, first we have epsilon greater than zero, right? By lemma, by lemma, for every epsilon greater than zero, we know that there exists a polygon path, polygonal path, right? Pick polygonal, poly from, from where to where? From alpha to beta, right? Such that we have If it's a polygonal path, the polygonal paths are piecewise smooth, right? They're piecewise smooth. Well, no, case one. Case one gives that f is equal to one and now we can just substitute this into here and this is true for n epsilon so this and this are epsilon close as desired okay so this is perfect and now we have a corollary so a corollary of a curve is a closed curve if gamma a is equal to gamma b so it's like it closed okay then if I have the same hypothesis if I close for it then it's line integral vanishes because because of it's equal to zero right because the same beta is equal to alpha So this concludes uh, the, this lecture, okay? Thank you guys.